Michael Ignatiev, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here, Yasha. Um, we have a lot of different things to talk about. Um, why don't we start with your assessment of the state of democracy in the world? You've been uh, an active politician in Canada. You have experienced the rise of authoritarian populism in Central Europe uh, up front as the rector of Central European University. Uh, and you're also one of the uh, great theorists of how uh, democracies can stand up for each other and uh, the meaning of democracy. So um, when you look at the world at the moment, how worried should we be? It's a good question, Yasha, because it's such an uneven pattern. I, I think you can look at the world in, for example, in the Scandinavian countries and you see robust, effective democracies that are innovating in terms of how they relate to citizens. Um, you can see that in the Baltic states. Um, I'm in Austria and Vienna. I can't really fault the way the city of Vienna uh, has managed the COVID crisis. Uh, my country, Canada, where I come from, has 80% vaccination rates. Canada has enduring agonies about maintaining its national unity, but over 130, 40 years, it's still going. I think where the crisis is obviously focused is in the lead democracy of them all, which is the United States. And I, I was just talking last night to a friend uh, who says, you know, the United States is actually in a state of civil war. That is, it's not declared, it doesn't require fighting, but it is a state in which people do not accept the legitimacy of basic decisions. So Republicans don't accept the 2021 election, the 2020 election. Um, imminently, if the Supreme Court uh, rolls back Roe v. Wade, millions of Americans simply won't accept the Supreme Court decision. And this is, this is when you do have a democratic crisis, when uh, closure can't occur when people don't accept the results of, of deliberation. And, and I'm no expert on that subject. All I can do is record concern. And, and when America's democracy is in trouble, then everybody thinks the world's democracies are in trouble. And that's not necessarily true at all. Um, if you then move on to Africa, there's some magnificent examples, unlikely examples. You know, Ghana, it's it's not perfect, but you know, they've had election after election after election, successful transitions. And I know what the statistics say globally, which is that we're in a democratic recession. Freedom House tells you that there are fewer democracies than there were. I get all that, but for some of this, the alarm seems to me overdone. What we need to do is focus where it's really critical. And I do think the situation in the United States is, is genuinely critical. One final thought before we move on, and this is based on my own experience as a politician. One thing that I think is a problem is the erosion of the legislature, the erosion of parliament, the ways in which the site of our democratic debates is simply emptied out. One of the most shocking things to me as a democratic politician elected twice to the Canadian parliament is nothing happens in parliament. I mean, it's, it's an empty shell. Same thing in the United Kingdom. Uh, a lot of the Congress is an empty shell. Same thing at the Assemblée Nationale in Paris. Now that is a systemic problem, which is the consolidation of executive power the waning of legislative power, and therefore an imbalance in the democratic system in lots of places. Now that, it seems to me, is a systemic problem. And <clears throat> I'm not quite sure what the solution is because having been a political leader, the one thing a politician wants is to control his legislature. And that's where you throttle uh, democracy. So we've got a lot of democratic uh, institutional reinvention that we need to try. And I would start with trying to fix what's wrong with our legislatures. That's very interesting. Um, let me ask you a question about that, because it seems to me that what I learned when I was an undergrad about uh, contemporary political systems is sort of a lie, which is to say that, that the idea is that there is a separation of powers into the three branches, the judiciary and the legislative and the executive. 
Um, but in most democracies in the world, the legislature and the executive are actually one in a meaningful sense, which is to say that because uh, the prime minister or the chancellor in many or most countries is elected by the majority within parliament, um, the two actually functionally uh, come from the same political faction. Uh, and of yes. course- and, and so we have what Lord Hailsham said 70 years ago in Britain, which is we have an elective dictatorship. And that's a shock. I mean, the, Hailsham was a great parliamentarian and he lamented the ways in which the executive power uh, in the British system was steadily eroding the prerogatives of parliament. And why this isn't just a sort of piece of, you know, insider political science baseball, you is when you're an MP yourself and you realize you have very little power and yet your citizens are coming to your office every day saying, Michael, fix this for me, help me. I, you know, you're, you're my representative. There's been a real waning of the representative function in our democracies, even in democracies that, as I said, have done a pretty good job managing some major crises. There is a crisis of representation. And I do think we need to restore the power of legislatures, even though let's be clear what the price is, it'll make government stickier, slower, more conflictual, um, things won't get done as fast. But I think the democratic gain is so important that that's where reform should focus. So, so I guess my question then is about the United States because the United States is uh, one of the countries, perhaps the most extreme country where the executive and the legislature do often come apart. It, for one reason, because presidential elections, the president is elected separately from Congress. For another, because there's some form of congressional election every two years, all of the House of Representatives and a third of the Senate. Um, and, and, and thirdly, because American political parties uh, have contained such huge varieties within them uh, that even a sitting president isn't always a very effective leader of their own political party. Um, but, but, but yet there seem to be two things in America. The first is that nevertheless, power seems to be concentrated in the White House rather than in Congress or within Congress in uh, the office of the, the House Majority Leader or the Senate Majority Leader rather than in rank and file uh, senators and certainly rank and file representatives. And secondly, to the extent to which there is actually uh, some power in parliament. It is not the power to do something that may be positive. It is the power to stop any kind of agenda from, from, from being carried through. So I guess, why is it that America, even though it does actually have more of a separation of powers in the way that it's set up, um, uh, end up with, in some ways, arguably the worst of all worlds? It's a, it's a, it's a great question because it appears to contradict what I just said, which is you need more power to the legislature. You're saying, well, look what happens when legislatures do have power. You have this kind of terrible impasse. I think what that teaches us is that institutions are not enough. There has to be comity. And I don't mean, you know, um, I, I just mean the distinction in a way that Carl Schmitt makes the notorious German political theorists between friends and enemies. You can't operate a political system without a premise of friendship. Friendship between adversaries. Um, friendship in the sense of we're all Americans or, you know, I got elected by the same kind of people you got elected, so whatever. And friendship is terribly important in politics. Um, and I, I don't mean to be sentimental about it. I've been in politics and politics is a very brutal business and there are costs to being friendly to the other side, but you can't operate political systems without friendship. And what I think has been terrifying uh, in the United States is the replacement of a politics of friends with a politics of enemies. And, and this then makes any possibility of legislative comedy just just impossible and it's that's why one of my friends has talked about a civil war because a civil war is a state where you know 
a politician across the other aisle regards you as an enemy who is about to destroy everything you value most and must be resisted by all means, fair or foul. That culture of antagonism is extremely dangerous to the stability of democratic systems. And, and I think we're living through a very bad period of it. It's, let's also, I mean, I'm a historian here, so let's not set our hair on fire. We can remember periods in American history where, for example, uh, uh, one senator crossed the floor, picked up a stick, and nearly beat another senator to death. Now, that was in the run-up to the real Civil War. So we've had terrible episodes of violence within the chamber. Um, so let's not forget we've been there before and we've walked it back, and I think we could walk it back again. But it... I, I fear that it's going to take some calamity to wake us all up. And I thought, in fact, that the calamity of January 6, 2021, and the invasion of the sacred precincts of the Congress would have been the calamity that would wake everybody up. But it doesn't appear to have been. And then that's another sign that I think democracy in America is in very, very serious place. Um, what's a moment when you were leader of the Liberal Party in Canada and uh, leader of, of the opposition, uh, when that decision of how do you treat a political adversary uh, became particularly salient to you? Is there a moment when you treated uh, uh, your political opponent uh, as an adversary uh, and it cost you politically? Or is there a moment when you treated them as an enemy and, and you came to regret it? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think the central drama of my short political career plays out these issues. I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure there are many experts in Canadian politics listening to this, so I'll try and keep it as simple as possible. But we had a decision as I was leader of the opposition whether to support a budget um, of the government, the Conservative government. And I felt, um, and the choice was whether to support that budget and remember when the budget, this occurred, this was in the middle of the worst months of the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. Our output was plummeting, unemployment was rocketing. And I really did think that if we could cooperate with the government, um, this was in the national interest, but it was clearly not in the party's interest because of opposition is supposed to oppose. Some members of my party wanted to form uh, an, a, a coalition with uh, the Socialist Party, the Social Democratic Party, and with, this is the key point, the Bloc Québécois, which is a separatist party. We couldn't overthrow the government unless we combined with the separatists. Now, the issue here is that the separatists want to break up my country. And I just thought, I can't get into bed with these people. They're not... <laughs> They're enemies of my country. I mean, but let's let me let me be, be careful here. They are good friends. They sit in the House of Commons with me. They just want something which is the end of my country. So I can't do an alliance with them. I just can't. Um, because we didn't do that alliance, we then allied with the government to pass their budget, which I thought was in the interest of the country because the country didn't need a kind of complete political explosion. But the consequence was that um, uh, the government got the credit for the budget. We didn't get credit for the budget. They went on to win the next election, and I got beat. So what, what I'm saying here is that ultimate choices of allegiance can have a, a hugely uh, consequential uh, effect on, on your life. And I think it's important. The Bloc Québécois example is interesting because here is an example of someone who I used to sit next to these guys in Parliament. They, on parle français ensemble. Ils sont de bons amis. They're good people. But on a fundamental issue of principle, I can't go into the same room with them, you know, politically. And, and so there's an example where they were adversaries, but I'd never consider anybody an enemy in the Canadian House. And, and in, in politics, in, Cana in American politics, to change the example, I don't think there should be enemies in the American house. I, I don't think there can be, except one kind of enemy who takes up arms against the system itself. 
the people who took up arms against Congress on the 6th of January are enemies. They have to be dealt with by the security forces. They have to be put in jail as they're being. But apart from that, there are no enemies. Provided you're prepared to use peaceful means in politics, you're an adversary. That, that would be my view of the basic uh, rule of, of, of political life. And every political system has to deal with it. The Germans have to deal with this. You have the AFD, provided they are constitutional, no problem. The minute they uh, associate themselves with violence to, against immigrants or anybody else, they are out of the political system. They're enemies of the political system and should be treated as such. So I'm not a softy about this stuff, but you've got to be very clear who the enemy is. And the enemy is a person prepared to use violence to achieve political ends. So, so let me think out loud here, right? I mean, the way that I think of the definition of populism is that it is somebody who doesn't regard the political competition as legitimate, right? Um, it's not just the anti-elitism of populism, but it's this defining feature. It's anti-pluralism to say that if you disagree with me, you're a bad person. You're not just wrong. You're not just voting for the person who wants the best for the country or has the best ideas. You're fundamentally a traitor to the country or something along those lines, right? Now, especially in a two-party system, but not only in a two-party system, that puts the other side into a real bind because how do you deal with somebody who is attacking democratic institutions in that way? And in the American context, I think Trump and the Republicans were doing that from 2016 to 2020. And since Trump continues to be pretty much in control of a party for now, the Republicans are continuing to do that. Not every single Republican politician, but a large and the most influential faction of a Republican party. But of course, that makes it very tempting to then say, look, anybody on that side they're the enemies of democracy. They don't accept anybody else as legitimate. So they're all illegitimate. Mm -hmm. And the moment I start saying that, I may have a better reason, but I'm actually in exactly the same logic. And when I look mm -hmm. certainly, you know, uh, on the dynamics on, on social media and other things now, you know, anybody who says they're not enemies, actually, they should be in some kind of way, only our adversaries, let alone your phrase, our friends, um, yeah. they then become themselves the enemy of, 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 of the people on their side of a political aisle. But, but I think there is a fundamental dilemma here, which I'm actually not quite sure how, how to deal with. How do you deal in a two-party system, especially with people who aren't pluralists, who aren't willing to accept disagreement? But if you say, we're casting them out, they're our enemies now, you become willingly or not, a kind of mirror image of that. Sure, if you're saying it is a huge dilemma for a Democrat how to deal with the politics of enemies without descending into the politics of enemies yourself. And I, I, I what can I say? I think you're right, because if you're on the receiving end of these kind of things, you end up looking weak. You end up looking like someone who's not prepared to stand up. You keep talking to them as if this was a civil conversation when it, they are modeling the conversation as war. Yeah, look, it, it, and, and my previous attempt to sort this out was to say, well, provided they don't use violence, then you've got to keep talking. I still think that's the case. But it, it, look, it's, it's extremely difficult. And, and this is a problem if I can shift from the United States to a context I know better, um, uh, Hungary, where I was rector of a university, this is the dilemma faced by the Hungarian opposition. They have, they are facing a regime that's been in power for 12 years, has run it as a single party state, has gerrymandered the constitution, gerrymandered the electoral system uh, in such a way that it's gonna be very difficult for the opposition to win. But suppose they do win, the dilemma they then face is whether they should alter the constitution themselves to get it back to the level playing they need, le level playing field they need in order to do anything. And then Orban will immediately say, well, you're tampering with the, pol with the political system. You're destroying democracy, right? You see, you, and, and you're using, you're doing what you criticize us for doing. And I can tell you the opposition in Hungary is worrying about this right at the moment. The problem is not what do we do 
you know, can we win? The problem now is what do we do if we win? How do we reverse a decade of single party rule? It's extremely, extremely difficult. I, I you know, maybe temperamentally, I'm urging caution because I think what you want to avoid is giving a defeated right wing the opportunity to go in the streets and try and settle this in the streets. Because that, it seems to me, every politician who's a Democrat does not want politics to go into the streets, that is, to be settled with fists and guns. And, but that is, a, it's a slight possibility in Budapest, but it's not a zero possibility, given Hungary's political history. So the dilemma we're talking about is right across uh, political systems that are ruled by right-wing authoritarians. Um, I think on balance to your question, you cannot play their game. You have to play as a Democrat. You have to win as a Democrat. And how do you do that? By persuading an, a, a substantial majority of the people to stand with you. And what happened in 2020 was a very moderate, rather conservative Democrat got up and said, stand with me. And what was it? 75 million people voted for him. And that, <laughs> that's how you do it, in my view. You don't play the politics of enemies um, because it, it, this, makes, this allows me to make a kind of fundamental, slightly sappy point, but one I believe, which is politicians have a double loyalty. They have a loyalty to their party but they also have a residual loyalty to the political system that makes everything possible. And I felt when I was in politics, I had that residual loyalty quite strongly at the moment when I had to make decisions. And you know, a lot of people listening to me, especially if they're Canadian, will say, what kind of a fool is that guy? He, he missed the chance to take power. Well, yes, I did, I did. But these are the kind of dilemmas that I think are intrinsic to political life. By the way, I think you 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 think through those dilemmas and through your political career in a really beautiful way in, in your book Fire and Ashes, which I which I recommend to every Canadian listening and even to every non-Canadian listening. Um, I am certainly not Canadian and 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 I got a lot out of it. It's a beautiful book. Um, uh, going to Hungary, um, uh, you know, we're in a very strange moment in American politics in which Viktor Orban. Uh, appears to have become the great hero of a very significant segment of the American right um, to the point that CPAC, which does not have a tradition of holding its conferences in random parts outside of America, um, is, is planning on holding its, its annual conference in Budapest, um, not because it's a beautiful city, which it certainly is, uh, mm -hmm. or because they decided they want to travel a little bit after the pandemic, which they certainly deserve, uh, but because it is a form of uh, adulation uh, or, and, and, and a show of solidarity with uh, Viktor Orban. So explain in the simplest term to people who have not followed the politics of a small country in Central Europe so closely, um, why Orban uh, isn't just a conservative, who is standing up for traditional values, uh, but really in your assessment and mine, uh, an, an, an enemy of democracy. Well, he's an authoritarian populist in power and that then draws people seeking power to him to see how he did it. And I think he's done it, um, greatly magnified the influence that he has. He comes from a very small country, only one of 27 states in the EU, it is a bit puzzling why big deal American right-wingers like Tucker Carlson and Vice President Pence go to see him. But I think it's because of his ideological um, uh, capacities. He's taken single party rule and made it into the defense of the Christian West against the Muslim threat. He's made it the defense of national pride against the rootless cosmopolitan liberals who want to impose liberal values on poor little countries. Um, he's vastly uh, inflated the ideological claims of 
the conservative right, given it a, to use the fancy word, a Weltanschauung. This guy is, a, is an ideologist of genius. He's the one who coined the famous phrase, illiberal democracy, to which one can only say, <laughs> there's no such thing. It, democracy is either liberal or it's not a democracy at all. But he's made these large claims and people flock because they, they want to give American conservatism this kind of grand metaphysical lift this is, we're standing up not just for America, but we're standing up against rootless cosmopolitanism, we're standing up for national frontiers, we're standing up for Christian values, all this stuff, uh, because I think there's a sneaking feeling, which I think is in interesting, which is that liberals may keep losing elections, but they keep winning the cultural battles. I mean, the great example being gay marriage. I mean, you know, one of the most moving recent experiences of my life was officiating at a marriage of two wonderful friends of mine in the middle of an Iowa cornfield in 2016, rib rock, Republican country. And you thought, wow, this is really powerful. Um, and so uh, to get back to Orban, Orban gives a Republican right that is losing a cultural battle, a whole new ideological umbrella that it can embrace, defense of Christianity, nation um, against, and it also has the very useful function of demonizing the enemy. So the, the enemy are us rootless cosmopolitans who disdain the patriotism of others and look down and condescend to people who don't have college degrees and the whole nine yards and it's a travesty and it's uh, but it's extremely effective um, i've never seen the intellectual class of which i'm a part more on the defensive in my lifetime than we are now so, so let uh, me ventriloquize the position that uh some conservatives would take in response to that which is that they would say no you're sort of getting it the wrong way around actually what's going on is that Orban is a proud defender of those quote unquote traditional values. You may not like them, you may oppose them, fine, that's your right in a democracy. But sort of the real animosity to Orban comes precisely because he's standing up for those values rather than because he's undermining democratic institutions. So um, just assuming that people really don't know anything about the Hungarian political system, what's happened there for the last 10 years, can you walk us a little bit through uh, why that's not the case, for why it is that Orban isn't just a conservative in those ways. For I, I agree that his ability to speak to those themes is why uh, Tucker Carlson went to Budapest to interview him and why he's sort of a star on the American right. Um, but, but what is it that he has actually done in government to, to attack democratic institutions? Um, and, and, and of course, feel free to speak also to your experience as, as rector of a wonderful university, Central European University, which was pushed out of Budapest um, oh, uh, I, I think you put your finger on a, 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 a key aspect. The big issue here, uh, Yasha, uh, and it's the biggest issue I think in, in global politics at the moment, is whether conservatism will stay constitutional or not. And Orban is a pioneer in a, in a, in a conservatism which is essentially not constitutional. That is, he, he won power fair and square in an election, and then he uses electoral victory to systematically weaken the counter-majoritarian institutions that balance majority rule in any democracy. It's no accident that he's the inventor of illiberal democracy since he set out to take apart the courts, the media, universities, um, all the regulatory institutions that used to be independent and systematically put them under his control. And this is, a con this is a conservatism, which in my view is at the edge of the constitutional order. And it means that uh, it, it raises the question of whether he will give power back if he loses or whether he will take it to the streets. I don't want to, I, I want, don't want to prejudge that outcome. I don't want to predict it. I, I just, we want to be clear that that is a possibility. Um, 
and, and, and this is an issue across the conservative world. And we forget another conservatism, which I'm an old liberal, but you know, the world was built after 1945 by much more by conservatives than by liberals. You think of de Gasperi in Italy, you think of Adenauer, you think of Churchill. These people, whatever you, you know, socialists and liberals didn't like these guys, but they knew that these people were constitutional. They, they believed in a constitutional order and they built the world that we live in. So I, and, and what is shocking about the conservatism of the last 20 years is that it flirts at the very edge of constitutional order and uses majority rule to systematically weaken the constitutional order of the societies in which they live. And that's the problem. I, to get back to your original um, comment to me, I, I, if Orban wants to defend Christian values and he wants to defend the Hungarian language and he wants to tell the Hungarians all kinds of stuff about how great Hungary is, who am I to object? You know, that, that's for the Hungarian people. But what is really significant for everybody is the dismantling of a constitutional order in, in Hungary, uh, because that's the model that I think has uh, dangerous uh, potential examples for uh, right-wing conservative populists across the political spectrum in Europe and in North America. So the Hungarian opposition has managed to unite to an extent, but it hadn't uh, before. Um, and in some recent polls, it does actually look as though they're going to be competitive against Fidesz in upcoming elections in, in the spring of uh, 2022. I think the last few polls look a little bit less positive on the opposition. It looks as though Fidesz is a little bit stronger again. But there is a real possibility, um, not a likelihood, but a real possibility that the opposition uh, would win if the vote is in fact counted uh, uh, fairly. Um, what is the range of possible outcomes? You've raised this a little bit there. I mean, how does this play out? If it really looks like the opposition is winning, is there a world in which the actual count of the vote is falsified? Um, I think, I think if that's- not, Is there some way that Orban stays in power even though the announced election results are in favor of the opposition? What, what, what are the different ways that this might play out? Well, the one thing I've been told by political scientists who know much more about than I do is that the opposition has to win with a 5% plurality. They can't want win 51-49. They have to win 55-50 at least in order to have a governing majority in uh, the and Hungarian You're not saying parliament. they have to have 55% of the parliamentary seats, but they have to have something like 52 and a half percent of the popular vote to get in order to gain a majority of the seats. Exactly. And even then they will be short of the two thirds majority that the current constitution provides for the passage of any serious legislation. So they, they win, but are short of a two thirds majority, then the Fidesz can then block pretty well everything they want to do. And so the opposition is debating what to do about that. Should we then rewrite the constitution to give us the power to accomplish what the people have elected us to do? And then the risk there is that Fidesz will say, you're dismantling democracy and you're accusing me of what I did. And so we're gonna take it to the streets. I, I just don't know what will happen. And that's, I think, the thing that is important about constitutional order. The point about constitutional order and democracy is you know what's going to happen. You, you, we know what's going to happen in the French election in, in the spring. It'll either be Mr. Macron or it'll be Madame Pécresse or it'll be something, but we know that whatever happens, they will be abide by the results and that'll be the end of it. And we'll get somebody, right? Um, what is alarming about the, the democratic episodes we're living through in the United States, think about 2024 and the Hungarian election 2020, we just don't know because we don't know whether the players will play by the rules and the rules do prescribe that Mr. Orban gives up power. Um, maybe he will, maybe he won't. And, and that's why I'm saying the issue of issues about conservatism now is, is whether they're constitutional. 
I started off by asking you about the state of democracy in the world. Um, like you, I'm very concerned um, and I've been making a pessimistic argument about the state of democracy for, for a long time now. Um, let me try out the more optimistic reading on you and see how much, uh, uh, how much mileage that has. Um, you know, I think there's three kinds of positive developments in the last couple of years. One is that countries in which authoritarian populists haven't yet won uh, seem to continue to be relatively resilient to them. So I'm in Germany at the moment, uh, the election there was quite reassuring. Um, the French election certainly is quite ugly with the rise of Eric Zemmour and the continuing strength of Marine Le Pen, but it, it looks likely, not at all certain, but likely that in the end Macron gets re-elected or perhaps Pucres wins or perhaps some, somebody else rises, but it, it doesn't look likely like that, that an extremist will get elected. Um, you know, in Scandinavia, in, in the Netherlands, in a bunch of European countries, uh, it feels as though the political system is calming down a little bit. So that's one good point. The second point is that uh, some of the authoritarian populists uh, who uh, were elected over the last five to 10 years uh, now seem to be on the way out. That is true of Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil. It appears, interestingly enough, to be true of Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines. I wouldn't yet want to bet on that, but it certainly looks like it right now. And of course it was true, at least for now, for Donald Trump in the United States, the most important case. Mm -hmm. And then finally, you are seeing a sort of incipient weakness, even of some of the authoritarian populists who've been in place for a really long time. So Orban looks more vulnerable right now than he has at any point, I believe, in, in his tenure so far, even though he's likely to survive in one way or another next year. Um, you know, Erdogan in Turkey and Putin in Russia are very firmly in control of the state apparatus and can no longer be dislodged by free and fair elections, I don't think. Uh, but they are actually quite unpopular uh, in, in quite a significant way. And so it seems to me like you can start to tell the story that we might recall if, if we have reason to tell uh, a story of triumph out of adversity five or 10 years from now. I, I don't think that's the most likely story but I can start to see what the story would look like if it came to be true. So I guess, you know, how much reason do you think we have for cautious optimism and how, what can we do to make that path most likely? Yeah, you put, you, you put together a more hopeful picture and I, I, I would buy some of it. Um, what I don't buy is, in fact, I'm going to quote you back against yourself, which is some of your own data showing the deep disillusionment with democracy among young people. That's worrying that the very high levels of non-participation and abstention among young people. I, I fought an election campaign in Canada, for God's sake, in which only one in five of people under 25 even bothered to vote. A, a voting percentage, a participation rate of 20%. I mean, it's just, you know, terrible. Um, so there's that. And then I've also said earlier when we were talking that there's some really advanced signs of institutional decay in, in the institutions of democracy, particularly the legislature. And there's the rise of a tremendous proliferation of unaccountable public agencies that just, where the public doesn't, really have any say so. And, and I do think the calls to renovate representation and, represent, and, and dramatically increase the capacity of the public to be involved in public debate and public deliberation is really overdue. So that's what I would set against this. That is judging the health of democracy by the state of the populist authoritarianism, populist authoritarians is not the only way to, to assess the fate of democracy. You also have to just look at democracy, even in places that are rather well governed. There's a great deal of institutional decay that just needs to be fixed. And you know we can fix it, I don't feel pessimistic. The other thing I would toss back at you, and, and not because I'm a pessimist, I kind of with you, I'm, I'm kind of constitutionally optimistic. Um, 
the other thing that I think is, is shadowing every political system in the world is climate change. And it's shadowing it because it seems like such a big problem and it's so global and it exceeds the capacity of national governments to do anything, but only national governments have the levers to do anything. And everything we do doesn't seem to be quite enough. Now, I'm not a climate alarmist, but I, I'm making a rather different point, which is that for a whole millions of our fellow citizens, there is a sense that democracy just isn't up to this challenge, period. I don't believe that. What I believe, in fact, is that all the kind of liberalism of a thousand tiny steps actually gets you there. I'm a believer in that. I'm a believer in markets. I think you need to price fossil fuels and you'll begin to get alternatives. And that's how we do it. Um, and I believe that we need we need to think of climate change as a political issue, not a religious issue. We need to get some stuff done. And the German coalition agreement is a sign. There's a big industrial economy that wants to do something. 10 years ago or five years ago, I was reading that, you know, <clears throat> the German economy was locked into diesel in a way that just would never allow it to get out. And now I read in my newspaper today that, you know, car registrations of electric vehicles are now 30% of the market. I mean, okay, you know, so I'm an optimist, but let's face the fact that most millions of people just think like Greta Thunberg, it's all blah, blah, blah. It's all too late. We can't do anything. And that is, <clears throat> that is directly affecting the perceived legitimacy of democratic systems around the world. So that's what I would come back to you on um, uh, there. Although I kind yeah. of agree. But I, I kind of, you know, it, it, it's kind of you to kind of agree with my optimism, but I also kind of agree with a pessimistic rejoinder. I mean, I'm really struck by, by the last point you made, which I've experienced a couple of times in the United States, but I experience at virtually every single talk I Europe. give about democracy in Europe. Nearly every single time there's a question from the audience saying, well, you're talking about the importance of democracy and saving democracy, but isn't democracy completely unable to deal with climate change? And shouldn't we get rid of it if that's what it takes to deal with climate change? Um, it, it's really remarkable and quite frankly scary how consistently that question is, is posed now in, in every European country where, where, where I've had the occasion through public events. Oh, oh. And we've got to, we've, we, we've, this is a real challenge for liberal gradualism because it's precisely liberal gradualism that everybody thinks is just useless. Um, but I, I, I'm a passionate believer in liberal gra gradualism. You make huge differences with a lot of small steps and you've got to use markets and incentives and you can make a, a difference. It, at my age, I think that's another thing. The, this perception that you have that it's democracy can handle climate change, particularly strong among young people. And I absolutely understand why. But when you get into your 70s, as I do, you look back now to when I was a graduate student at Harvard in 1970, and I saw my first Earth Day poster, the famous poster of the Earth seen from outer space. And from that time forward, the one thing that's really a fact about our situation is that global awareness and understanding of the global ecosystem has climbed vertically since then. The consciousness, the understanding, the science of the environment is just, it's unimaginably different. And it's created a public consciousness, which is producing this pessimism. But that same public consciousness is the engine <laughs> <laughs> that will make democracy do something. That's what I think about this. Um, let's go from liberal gradualism to liberal internationalism. Um, uh, you've written a beautiful piece for persuasion, uh, arguing that liberal internationalism is, is in crisis because of its missteps, um, because of some of the ways in which it's failed to deal with real problems. Um, but though we should nevertheless hold on to the idea that, ah, excuse me, that we should nevertheless hold on to the idea uh, that uh, 
we should try and uh, uphold something like that least favorite term in international rules, rules-based order. Uh, and in fact, perhaps that countries like the United States or Canada should continue to try and ensure uh, that they show up democracies uh, around the world, that they protect them against authoritarian advances. What's the case for that kind of liberal internationalism? What would it look like and how would it avoid some of the pitfalls uh, that the most muscular or military forms of liberal internationalism uh, have, have fallen into for the last decades? Well, I, you know, Afghanistan was a kind of moment of truth for, for a certain kind of liberal internationalism. And I think that um, we've learned some extremely painful lessons. Um, we didn't know anything about Afghanistan. That's another thing. We didn't know anything about Libya. <laughs> we didn't know very much about former Yugoslavia. The ignorance behind um, our interventions um, has cost us has cost us dearly. So that's one um, uh, lesson. I think we've also learned some things about just how blunt um, the military instrument is and how dangerous it is to use it. Um, I think the third thing we've learned is that you can't get anything done unless you have buy-in domestically, unless there are people prepared to fight and die for you know, a democratic order, you, you, you can't impose it from outside. So these are, these are simple lessons, painful, learned at a horrible cost. The internationalism I, I think we need flows in part from what we were just talking about, about climate change. We simply, I, I don't believe uh, in the COP26 process particularly. Um, I, I think, in fact, it's going to be nation by nation, market by market that's going to do this. But I do think we need international um, standard setting, international meetings, international stuff, because so many of these problems now can't be solved by um, uh, national politics and a politics that focuses only on the national interest. The national interest now intersects with global interests all, all the time. The biggest problem we've got, Yasha, is I think a crisis in universalism. Um, liberal internationalism was sustained by a kind of sense that goes back two or three centuries, it goes back, in fact, much back to you know St. Paul's epistles, that we're one, you know, we're one human race with a common fate and common interests. And that's in terrible trouble. It's being pounded apart by nationalism, tribalism, partisanship. Um, and fear. And uh, you can't build any kind of liberal internationalism unless we rebuild a sense of um, universalism. But it's going to have to be a very tough universalism that understands who we can be responsible for beyond our borders and what we can be responsible for. And it can't be everything you know, we can't be our brothers or sisters keeper everywhere, but we can do some things that strengthen this sense that we're all in this big planetary boat together. And that, that is currently in, in, in danger. Human rights is, is being pounded apart everywhere. Um, this sense of obligation beyond borders is, is in terrible trouble everywhere. And that needs to be rebuilt, I think, from the bottom up. There's a big intellectual project here to just revive the universalism that would sustain a liberal internationalism. Um, I think the, the importance of universalism and the fight over it seems to me to be absolutely key to this political moment, actually. Um, uh, both uh, and universalism is something to which you can come from very different roots. You can come to it from a Christian theology. You can come for, to it from uh, a, a love of ancient philosophy. Um, you can come to it from Marxism. You can come to it, as I tend to, from philosophical liberalism. Um, uh, you can come to it from, from, from a kind of conservatism. There's very different traditions that can sustain a universalist outlook. Um, but it's under attack from this sort of explicit tribalism of the right, I think it's also under attack uh, from some left-wing philosophies. And, and, and that to me does seem to me to be sort of a core of a lot of the political debates today. 
Oh yeah, um, and, 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 but one of the premises of universalism is that it is possible for a white man of a certain age to take off his helmet and enter the mental and moral world of a person of a different race, a different gender, a different age. Um, universalism makes a big bet on, not on empathy, which is too soft, but just simply on the fact that we can actually imagine what it is like to be someone else. Our art, our culture, our every art and culture in the world tells you that. And yet we've walked away from it with a sense that only a black man or woman can understand what a black man or woman has experienced and suffered. And some of that is true. It's partly true, but it's also partly false. Uh, and, and so we, we won't rebuild universalism unless we can begin to trust each other that we can know what other people feel and have lived. And we can respect and understand a history very different from our own and act upon what we then understand. I, I want to end our conversation by uh, talking about uh, your wonderful new book on consolation, which, uh, uh, you know, did in fact accomplish uh, the feat rare among books of, of consoling me. Um, and it's, it's, it's beautifully written besides. Um, uh, the book um, is, tells the story of great thinkers and figures of, of, of history from Marcus Aurelius to uh, Montaigne and from Camus to Havel, um, uh, thinking about, as the subtitle implies, how to find solace in dark times. Um, why don't you tell us one of those stories of, 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 of solace and perhaps a little bit about uh, how we personally uh, faced with dark times personally uh, during the pandemic? Um, many of us have dark times politically um should 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 stay strong uh uh you know to the outside world but also within ourselves well the project began yasha because i was ast astonished by how moved and affected i was by religious language particularly the psalms and i i'm a, not a believer but I, I i wanted i began to puzzle out why it is in a secular society we have this kind of religious unconscious that seems to be triggered in moments of, of distress and difficulty. We, we find ourselves slipping back into this ancient language. And so that's where the project started. And then um, I just began following, following my nose. I'll tell you one story about this tradition in a way that I've uncovered. Um, you know, it, it, there's this famous Roman senator called Boethius, who serves a barbarian king and is then accused of betraying the barbarian king and is sent to be executed and wrote this very famous book called The Consolations of Philosophy while he was awaiting execution. And it's been, it then had a long life into the early Middle Ages. And one of the people who, and, and the issue is whether philosophy can console you. And the answer in Boethius is a little ambiguous. But one of the people who read it was uh, Dante. And Dante was very affected by Boethius. And in fact, Boethius imagines a conversation between lady philosophy and the despairing prisoner. And um, when Dante writes his wonderful uh, Inferno and Paradiso, uh, he imagines it also as a dialogue between a wise woman and a humble searcher and i think the influence is very very direct um, then you jump forward a thousand years to the summer of 1944 when a young italian chemist is trudging through um, auschwitz with a french friend and suddenly the french friend says you know teach me some italian and <laughs> primo levi it is primo levi suddenly begins to recite lines from Dante that are part of Dante's connection back to Boethius. And the lines are, uh, 
just as they reach the place where they're going to pick up their soup to take back to the barracks, Primo Levi remembers that the lines of Dante are, we were not born to be brutes, but to live in dignity and knowledge. And the words have this incredible effect on Primo Levi because they say to him, there is a life beyond Auschwitz where human beings can be human beings. And it's a promise of hope. There, there will be a world in which people understand what Dante means. So the book is an attempt to tease these connections out across a thousand years. It starts with a man in prison in barbarian Europe in 524, goes to Dante in Ravenna in 1320, and then ends up in Auschwitz in 1944. These skeins of meaning that console people and they hand on to the next generation. And that's what the, the kind of story the book uh, tries to, to tell, because I think that we tell ourselves a sort of enfeebling story about modernity, which is that we're marooned away from religious consolation. Our traditions are of no use to us. <laughs> We're kind of stuck with dark times, environmental crisis, democratic crisis, you know, political partisanship with no, no sources of, 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 of comfort and consolation. And I, I just wanted to say, look, no, that's, <laughs> that isn't right. Just go back to your library a little, read some of this stuff. It just, it, this sense, what I what I found consoling writing it, and I hope others will, is the deep continuity of human experience, the just absolutely unbroken continuity of human experience, meaning that although we are divided by time and history from understanding what it was like to be Boethius or Dante, they we know exactly what they're feeling about some things. We know that they felt desperation akin to ours. We know that they felt fear just like us. The continuity of human experience is a sense of solidarity with our ancestors, with the dead. The dead are not lost to us. The dead continue to speak to us. And, and what the dead say to us is in my view, one of the most consoling things of all. Michael Ignatiev, thank you so much. Pleasure.